Described as the best of the best by fitness industry icon Mark Mastrov, today's guest has over four decades of experience in 24-hour fitness, Gold's Gym, California Fitness, Crunch, UFC, and other iconic brands around the world. This episode is a deep dive into every element of fitness, from finding the right location, branding, sales secrets, and personal training strategies. Please join me in welcoming one of the early pioneers of the Asian fitness industry, Mr. Eric Levine, to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Well, Eric, thank you very much for inviting me into your house. And what My a pleasure. beautiful house it is. Welcome. <laughs> thank you. I'd love to move in. <laughs> yeah, th so, so thanks very much. Um, so I, I've... Uh, I've heard, for, for, I've been in the industry for about 20 years and wherever I've gone and certain places around the world, you know, your names come up. And, um, Don't believe them. <laughs> so it's nice to have actually sort of met the, met the man and, and the, the legend of, that so many people sort of uh, talk about. Thank so. you, thank you. <laughs> so t tell me a little bit about, you know, yourself. How, how did you get into this sort of uh, interesting and dynamic business? Well, my father was an athlete and we grew up in Montreal, Canada. We were in the, the same neighborhood as Ben and Joe Weider and my father used to work out with them. And my dad was a, a national water polo and volleyball player. So we were all about health. I mean, for when I was 12 years old, my father bought the Weider weight set <laughs> and you know, started when I was that young. So it was part of my DNA, I think. And at, when I was, uh, 16, there was this chain of spas, they were called at the time, um, Vic Tannies, similar to Jack LaLanne in America. And a friend of mine had worked there and he told me, well, I was, I was into the martial arts at the time, and he said, well, you only have to work Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because women work out Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So men and women didn't work out together. Uh, I said, well, that's good. And I said, what do you do? He said, well, I'm like a fitness instructor. To make a long story short, I went to interview and I had a very intensive training to qualify. It was, it was, he asked me, do you have running shoes? And I said, I do. He said, well, you're hired. <laughs> so that was the extent of it, you know. But the very first day, I just loved it. I loved the smell of the chlorine for the pool, the, you know, the atmosphere. And about a week later, the manager said to me, can you take me on a tour? around you know, the club what you, when I give you a guess, what you do? And I said, sure, why? He said, well, everyone you've taken a tour signs up. I said, well, isn't that what you want? He said, yeah, but why? But I knew right away when I, even though I was young, I knew that it wasn't about the swimming pool or the whirlpool. It was about listening to what the guest, what the member needed and wanted and hearing really what they said. So they're into swimming. I'm not going to focus on the the 50, the 150 pound dumbbell, going to give them what they want. And it never changed actually. So within, within a matter of, he asked me to be a salesperson, which I was. And then I was an assistant manager within 30 ish days. I'm only 16. And then I became a manager of, uh, of their new home office, big club, which was a walk from my house that I, in Montreal. And was telling your, your director of photography who came before you today that at the time, a Corvette, to give you an idea, was $5,000. A new, beautiful 427, mm -hmm. 435 horsepower Corvette, $5,000. And I was making $5,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> so not only, I, you know, I was having so much fun meeting, meeting everybody, seeing the results, the energy, the, 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 the whole, the whole, feeling I got, I would have done it for free. Right. I was having the best time and I knew, I saw the results that people were having and it was astounding. And I, and I really got off on that. Of course, the money was fa fantastic. Mm. But that was my first taste of, of that, of the actually, the financial aspect of the industry. And I was an athlete all the time, but th making people healthy was like, and my father had put that into my brain about mm. exercise and how important. But to give that to somebody else, and it was it really made a difference in my life. And that was how I how I started. It was I got it right away. I was addicted right away. The right. very first day, 
even though I locked myself in the chlorine room and I nearly died, he told me, don't lock yourself. In the, but he was telling me so many things. And he says, because our, our lock is broken and it's going to shut on you. I just remember hearing the shut of the door and saying that's what he meant. So, that was, so it nearly ended quickly, that nearly, story. Yeah, right, right. So, so wh where, where did you go from sort of like, you know, selling? And was you a trainer as well at the same time? Again, at that time, my whole training was, do you have running shoes? Right. So yes, I, we did calisthenics and the weights were pretty simple. So yes, it, I was a non-certified, right. non-certified, non-certified trainer yeah. at that time. Yeah, Right. that was my start. So what, what, what was the kind of big break then from where it went, you know, from, from there next? The, I went from there to now you, picture so, so I'm in I'm in this world and my father's a businessman and I was making at that time I've been in a year a little bit more and I'm making almost six thousand dollars a month that at the time and this you know top lawyer level top doctor level uh, and my dad's proud of that plus I'm making people healthy or mm -hmm. helping to them get them healthy so he's proud of that and as a father, making that kind of son, making that kind of money, that's also important. And I saw this cover of a Newsweek magazine with, you know, Christy Brinkley style girl, the long blonde hair flowing. And the title was The Geos of Club Med, the True Gypsies of the World. And I didn't know what a Club Med was, I didn't know what a Geo was, I know, but I, I was enticed by the, the cover read that magazine, and by the time I put that down, and it was February in Montreal, it was like, or the end of January, there was so much ice on the window inside my door that, you know, I went and got that magazine, reading that magazine. That night, I spent all night putting my resume together, sending it off to France to become a GO at Club Med. And so that was January. I get a letter, please come to New York for an interview, which I, you know, I went there and then I got the letter in April saying, congratulations, you're hired in Martinique mm. in the French West Indies to go. So that's the good news, right? Okay, so it's a dream come true. I'm going to go into paradise mm. because of how they described this and the movie that they showed me when I was in New York. <laughs> I mean, I would have done anything <laughs> to get there. And then, of course, I had to tell my father that I'm leaving this to go to, no one knows where Martinique is. I'm going to Martinique and here's the catch. He said naturally, he said, oh, you know, he's hearing that but not really hearing it. He says, and how much money are you going to make? And, you know, thinking that his son isn't that crazy. He's not going to leave a high paying job yeah. to do something stupid. Or, so I said to him, well, they pay for all your food, you're dun, 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 just like a guest. Uh -huh. And how much are you making a month? And I said, well, they pay for every six months. You're going to, you know, saying everything I could to get around that. And finally, he said, how much do they pay you? And I said to him, $60 a month. <laughs> he didn't react. He didn't, he didn't hear it. It was too absurd for his son to go from that to that. Yeah. He said again in a gentler voice, how much are they paying you? And I said it again. Again, it was too absurd for his brain to hear me say $60. But I left that job to do $60 a month. And I spent four years doing that. And what was that, just because you wanted to travel and get a different yeah, experience, you think? it was Pir Pirates of the Caribbean. It was just like everyone that worked there were the same DNA. They were all from all over the world, adventurers. Uh, and the people we met were fantastic. Every six months he went to a different part of the world. And our rooms were mediocre, like three star at best. The food was three, it was a three star situation, but we were overbooked every week. We had space for 600 people, we had seven, 800 people. The geos were living four and five to a room. And I learned all the marketing, all the advertising, all the, the magic of a brand when it is totally encompassing. The fabric from the 
15 second ad that you'd see in Montreal in the dead of winter, the antidote to civilization, the feeling of the, of the wind blowing your hair, to actually making the people when at the parking lot leaving, they're crying their eyes out because they can't leave. Or a doctor saying, I'll be anything if I can stay an extra month or two. I'll give up my whole practice. <laughs> I saw how a brand could change somebody's life. I mean, I knew, I was the only one they hired out of over a thousand applicants in New York. Yes. I knew though that there was a thousand people that would take my job, mm. like this, $60 or, or whatever. And everybody on the, in the group knew that and they loved being there. And again, we would have worked for free and we worked long hours, but it was, it was, we were in a special movement and the company created this, the, the hordes of people come from all over the world. They came there knowing that this is what was happening. And when they left, we gave them many times what they expected. And if you can do that, it doesn't matter if your membership is $9.99 a month or your class is 45 bucks for 45 minutes. When they get off that seat or finish that boxing, they feel like they got double or triple the value. You did it. Mm. You did it. And that's where I learned about marketing and branding. From the music that they played, uh, because you're on an island, they had this Roman music, and that's when the, the food was being served. Every detail, what we wore, what was presented to the, how the workers, the GOs, John T, or nice organizers, worked together with the GMs, the gentle members, the language, the music, the, the, how we had to be part of them. It wasn't member and staff. It was club. It was a real club. And instead of it being a vacation a week, they were part of a club. And that never, never left me. I, that was my real indoctrination into that mm. world. And today I still say that that's, it hasn't changed. It doesn't matter that it's all social marketing now. Because what the person says on social marketing, if they say, I got an experience 10 times the value of what I thought I was going to get. It's always been word of mouth. It's always been word of mouth. In our industry, buddy referrals, it's always been that way. Just more electronic now. But what, was it? what, what, what do you think of some of the in ingredients that was there that you know, can be applied today from that business? You know, was it unique due to the fact that you were actually on vacation and you were going away to a beautiful island or whether, you know, are there some sort of ingredients that you can, uh, you know, you can just apply to, you know, a, a boutique studio or a fitness club then? That's a great question. It's, when you go to a club that is a club, the very first opening of the door, I mean, I used to say I could go to any of my clubs and open the door and I know exactly what's, the man, you know, the, what's happening throughout the club. We're all, we're all sensitive. You walk in and you have a receptionist that knows you. Hey, Eric, how you doing? Nice to see you. Versus, you know, a high-end place. It's cold. And, you know, you know, you put your finger in whatever. It's, it, it, it hasn't changed. It's, it's the same thing. Um, it's the overall fabric. I mean, you have, from the, all the touch points have to be, it's like Four Seasons. They know your how then they know your name. For me, I get to the I get to the refrigerator, and they have only Diet Coke. So they took away all the alcohol, took away the the regular. They already have that. They already don't do this. This is their their research. I think that it's it, it's the same. It's it's the same. It doesn't matter if you're nine ninety nine, you know, a low cost club. If the person leaves with the feeling that they should be paying $59 for that versus going to a very expensive club and having the reception not know their name or, not, or be on their phone or whatever. We're all human. We know when we're being respected. We know when we're at the right place. We know it. We feel it. 
and it's it's from the first second you open the door till you leave. And as a, a gym owner, to be able to instill that in your team, it's an art. Mm -hmm. They have to be part of it. I remember one day in Thailand, we were having our yearly uh, talk, whatever, and it was personal trainers. We had 10 clubs at the time. So we had about two or 300 personal trainers there. And I asked them, how many of you worked out every day? Hoping to get, you know, no, no hands went up. Second, how many of you worked out four days a week and no hands went up? How many of you work out twice a week and five or 10 hands went up? How many of you work out once a week and maybe 30 hands? 80 or 90% never worked out. And that, that put me on my, on my butt and said, well, we're, it's, it can't happen like that. These people have to walk the, the, they have to make it, they have to believe in it. There's no way you're gonna learn from a book. You gotta feel the pump, you gotta feel your ab, you gotta feel the, the, the excitement from your pituitary, you gotta feel that. And you know, when we were going through Asia, it was so forward, foreign to the culture of that, that it took time. And we just put our whole focus in at that time to everyone had two hours off a day. It wasn't part of their lunch. This was, it, we couldn't make it mandatory fitness, but they're already in the club. The home office had to leave. They had to close the home office, they had to go work out. We had to instill the culture um, because we, that's so valuable to the overall wow experience, we would call it. It was just mind-boggling that they weren't working out. But when you hiring, going back to Club Med, the hiring process, they hired the adventurer. They hired the, the, the giver, the server. They hired the one with the sparkle in their eye. It's no different than when you're hiring in, a, in, your, in your gym or your whatever. There's people that will have the sparkle. Go for it. I mean, hiring wrong, we've all done that so many times. They have a great resume, they were whatever, but do they have the sincerity? Do they believe, are they part of the team? Or do, are they part of that song? Sometimes you can make it. You can get your whole team involved in it. You know, we, we used to do every hour, we'd all get together like a football team with the members and wow, 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 and do whatever we could to, to raise the energy. And the clubs that did it were always outperforming that every time. But you say that a big part of that, is, as well as the, the recruiting the right type of people, but, but also you know, getting, you know, getting that team to perform. I suppose you said in terms of Club Med, it was a three-star uh, rooms, the food was three-star, but there was some magic there. Is that really down to what the people can create, that energy? And, exactly, yeah. exactly. I mean, it's... I mean, Group X, for instance. You go to a Group X class, it's full. It's full. And the trainer doesn't have any more, the, the Group X doesn't have any more experience than the next one. But she or he gave, gave that. Gave the, that special thing that the members felt. And that's it. It's priceless. Mm. And uh, we feel it. You can't fake us out. And that's it. Or a personal trainer who's there's 100 people that want to go with her or him. Yeah, they have a certification the same as anyone else. They give it, and they bring it, and they get it, and that's what you are. How do you create that? Is it, a, a, you know, I've heard some interesting stories about, you know, people earning some fantastic money whilst they're with you, but, it, you know, it, it must be more than just the, the, the salary that sort of gets these people to do that. You know, what are, what are some of the things that you've used along your career to, to create that in, you know, a big business across multiple different countries? That's another great question because, you know, growing up the way I grew up or being in America or Canada, money is a big motivator. It is all over the world. Let's be clear on that. But not all the time at the same time level that, of importance that we give. I remember um, in Korea, we were head clubs in Korea, we gave medals out that they would wear on their, if they were a salesperson on their jacket, or if they were a personal trainer. We had different, we were the first group to have different levels of trainer, where we had senior trainer, we had 
trainer, personal trainer, we had senior trainer, we had master trainer. And the master trainer's picture was bigger, they had different color, they, it was called master trainer, and those were the things that they would try to, to get, and certain medals and what the medals represented, you know, and that was worth more to them than money. Or a, we had a pin that had a diamond on it, and they fought to get that pin much more than if we said, okay, maybe the pen cost $1,000, but this was a special pen. This was because you did that. And that was much more important than money. Mm. Um, today, uh, you know, we hear about hard sells, and I remember I did a CNBC Managing Asia hour live, and this was uh, in Singapore, and the first question she asked me before even introducing me was, you're Mr. Hard Sell. You know, that's how it started. I said, welcome, you know, my name's Eric, what's your name? I said, let me ask you a question. If my product is happiness, fun, and health, why would I have to hard sell that? Really, would I, would I have to? It's not about that, it's about passion. Maybe we're overpassionate about what we are giving you, but it's not about hard sells. And I still believe that today. Uh, sure, people are more sophisticated and they're more aware of different sales techniques. That has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with the price. It has to do with believability, passion, giving the people what they want, and they said in their interview. And it's the same way today. When we, however, now when I would start a new company, I certainly would do over time. I wouldn't give the majority of the money up front to a sales counselor, for instance, and I would give it over time as they service the member. Yes, maybe they're not doing personal training. Maybe their main focus and responsibility is sales. But we want the member to stay. And we want him to be able or her to get paid like an annuity, like an insurance company, as the longer they stay, the better. Right. And that keeps the personal training and the sales counselor on the same page. So you, the techniques would change from when we were in Asia and, and things like that, but the motivation through money, through awards, rewards, uh, and recognition, you know, the employee of the month thing that is everywhere, very important. Parents bringing parents in for, we would have, we would have parents, we bring in the parents and, and spouses all the time to our parties and honor them because as you know, we're 60, 70, 80 hours in the, in the club. You have to have a supportive spouse or husband or right. whatever. We'd honor them and then they would see how we would honor their, their family on stage with the trophies and accolades and everything. And those things were as important as money. Mm. You know, and I think today it's the same way. And it, advancements and whatever you can do that find out what is important in that culture and give it to them. Yeah, because I guess you, you, you were working with lots of different cultures, I suppose. Was that, did you have to adapt your approach when you went into new countries like Korea compared to America? My guess is you motivate people slightly different. Is that, yeah. is that right? Yeah, it's, um, and each country is different. Each country, they may be Chinese, but Chinese in China are different than Chinese in Hong Kong, different than Chinese in Singapore, Taiwan. They're all slightly different. It's we were creating a new industry. It hadn't been there yet. So they accepted the fact that we were leaders in that. But you can lead, but you can't bully. You can lead, but you can't oppress. You can't say, you have to do this. This is the way of the you, know, you have to have that balance of having confidence that, yeah, you do what we say and you're gonna get what, what you want without pushing it in their face. And some countries are very uh, close to their food. It's an important part of their life. So you tell them, well, forget that bowl of noodles and have a protein bar. That <laughs> ain't gonna happen. Not then. As education happens and things, people get more aware and used to it, yes. But when you first come to a place and you know they don't even, they've never seen these machines before, I mean, we opened up in Hong Kong in 1996. 
and we sold, we pre-sold 3,200 members. I think more than half had no idea what they bought. <laughs> and we, we had the pictures of machinery on the wall. We had Cindy Crawford saying, come to my club, but no, right? And, and, and tell me that, like, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit, but tell me the story about the, the club in Hong Kong because it was, a, I guess it was a big gamble for a start in yeah. terms of how, you know, how you've financed and funded that. Do you, you want to share that? Sure. Well, you know, it goes to, everyone's talking now, I mean, the buzzword is quantum, quantum visualization, acting as if, the power of attraction, secret, you know, all those principles. Well, they've been around for decades, and they're just being more proof, and now they're scientific proof. Dr. Joel Dispenza, he can show how the, the neurons, the frontal lobe lights up when you, you know. Back then, I was practicing all that as well. And I had already, I, I'm in Hong Kong, I had already visualized the members. Right. I had already visualized the, the, the excitement, the smiles. I visualized the, the returns on the investment, the, 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 what it looks like to have you know, 100 people in your Group X class, Chinese people, and what the building would look like. I visualized all glass on the ground floor, in your face, excitement, and... Everyone's telling me at the same time, the Chinese people will work out. Women will never work out in front with a man, and they won't sweat in front of a man. This isn't our culture. Go home. Uh, we couldn't get a, a, a longer than a year's lease. We asked, we spent four million dollars on our first club, and what do you mean on the twelfth month, thirty-first day, it's over? You take it over, and they had no such thing as EFT and all this stuff. And you know nobody knows me. I'm going to these landlords, and they're kicking. Literally, one one landlord was blowing smoke ring cigars on my nose, like with perfection. And I'm thinking this isn't going to work. And but I, I had already visualized it. I well, was, actively, you, it was like you had a, you set, you, you decided that you wanted to have one, and you were imagining this on an ongoing basis. Where you were. I had already moved there, and right. I already made the commitment that this is going to happen. I had done my research that, you know, I walked around my first night, I saw all the, uh, the women with, with branded, you know, Louis Vuitton, Chanel. They must have saved up for months to get it, maybe, I was thinking. Uh, so, and Madonna had just come out with her yoga. It was ready to happen, kind of. And I knew it would work. I knew there was going to be challenges, but I was so into the visualization, acting as if, creating it so detailed for the universe to give it, the direct vibration coming back to me that I remember the guy blowing the smoke rings on my nose, leaving there and thinking that, well, this is going to be a little bit more tough, but I, I, I see the building I want. And as I'm walking out and making the, turning the corner, there's a, there's a sign going up for lease. And this building was four stories, all glass, huge ground floor, no doors, inches. It was a, a former department store, exactly like my visualization that I had been doing. And kind of, I knew I was going to get it. Really? But how am I going to get it? So there was one person that I knew. He was also from Montreal. He was a big businessman. And his restaurant was called California. And we're opening California Fitness. And I asked him, I said, look, I want to open up this and that. And that building, which was right across the street from his restaurant, do you know the owner? He said, I do know the owner. And would you get me an appointment with him? He said, I'll get you an appointment with him. And so I met him. And he said, uh, I told him what it was. And he was kind of an international guy. And he says, sure, no problem. It's $250,000 a month. So I kept the smile on my face, but, you know, my, my, my world was rocked. And I said, oh, that, that's all? $250,000? I said, how long a lease is it? You know, trying to, like, catch my breath, <laughs> trying to deflect. He says, well, it's a year lease. I said, well, we put, you know, millions of dollars. We can't do it. So I'll give you a five-year lease, calling my bluff. So I said, okay, you know, we'll do it. So I called my partner, Ray Wilson. Who was, he was in the 70s at the time. He's 92 now. Uh, I called him and said, Ray, I found the perfect location. My heart's pounding. So, you know, how much is it? 
I said, well, it's $250,000. He said, well, great. How did you get it so cheap? And I said, a month, Ray. A month. <laughs> Silence. I didn't hear anything, thinking that it's a heart attack, defibrillator, whatever. But we put it together. We actually got that location. And the numbers that we would do in that club, I would buy lunch in a pre-sale by 1 o'clock. Because everyone goes to lunch at 1 o'clock. We had $100,000 up, U.S. We pre-sold 3,200 members. It was $500 to join, to talk to U.S. dollars, $100 a month, first and last two months. We had recouped our investment within four or five months after opening. We had the governor patent, because we were still British at the time, oh, yeah. cut the ribbon, and we took off from there. But there was that time, everyone telling you, not going to happen, can't find the right building, we can't afford the right building, they'll never work out together. And at the time, I was so into the power of attraction, believability, acting as if. And I really think that that was the push that I needed to take me through the naysayers, which was everybody. <laughs> um, and I had to do, th again, it's a whole new industry, so I had to find the location, do the PR, do the advertising, do the marketing, do the training, do the forms, set up the home office, hire the people, train the people. And I sold 1,200 out of the 3,200 memberships because I wanted to get first-hand experience. I wanted to hear if they said, that's too expensive, I don't want to work out with men, whatever it was, I didn't want to have it as a filter from somebody else. I needed to get the real experience. And I'm so thankful that I did that because I understood it. Mm. I got it. And that was, that was how we launched it. It was so exciting. It could have gone terribly wrong quite easy though, couldn't it? Oh yeah. Because when you, when you get to a place that you're the leader, yeah, you're the leader, but you can't be that far mm -hmm. when you got $250,000 a month. No. You have to be catch the wave. Not before the wave, you know, you've got to catch it. There was no health food stores. They, they didn't even have Diet Coke. They didn't, that wasn't part of, the, part of it. You know, MTV just started. So it was, it was a gamble as to the timing, but not the inevitability of health hmm. coming to Hong Kong's very sophisticated people. So we chose the right location, a very international, in a very good area, and it, it took off. Yeah. But yeah, if, if I didn't have that training of <laughs> believabilities, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> I, I could have panicked. Yeah. Oh yeah, I could have panicked. And, and, and I guess you had to sort of convince Ray also to sort of jump in on that. Was Ray was uh, a lover of Asia. Oh, yeah. He was the first one that when we, when family fit, we were partners in Family Fitness Center when uh, we merged with 24 Hour it's called 24-Hour Nautilus at the time. We created 24-Hour uh, Fitness. We that was a Mark Mastroff. Mark yeah. Mastroff. And we decided that, okay, let's open up Asia. And we were still partners in 24-Hour, but let's give, let's give it a shot. Ray loved, he wanted to do originally low cost in the Philippines. But when I landed in Hong Kong, I said, no, this is it. We go for the high end. We do it right here. They have the money, they're ready to go. If we had done it in the Philippines, it wouldn't have worked. There were, it was too far, really? too far of a stretch. So we were- Was that because Hong Kong was more developed in that region? International uh, uh, feeling. A lot of um, international Chinese that had been out and had seen this. You know, they understood that and we did it right. We went, we hired the best PR firm, we hired all the celebrities to be part of it. We made it, not about fitness, we call it exertainment. We, it really wasn't about fit, it was about our card being more important than a Black American Express card. Show that and you're super cool. This represents James Bond, Jane Bond. You're the, you know, got, show your card. And that's how we did it. We, we, we used that more than, you know, building your biceps or getting legs like Cindy Crawford. Right, so it's more like a s status. Yes. Right. And that's how we did personal training, the same thing. There's no such thing as personal training. So we had to create the fact that if you don't have a personal trainer, you're not the high level of cool. Okay. And if your personal trainer doesn't have a master, he's, he's not a master trainer, he's just a regular trainer, 
we had clubs that were doing 500000 a month. Yeah, I, I've training. heard that. That's amazing. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, we were paying a lot to our, to our staff. I remember the first week, so these were all um, first-timers. No one had sold any memberships. There was nothing to be sold. And I remember the first week going to the bank and telling them in advance I want U.S. dollars cash and how much I gave. And we paid some people for the first week. We overpaid because I... We were giving the first month EFT to them. We cut that in half right away. But that first week, I mean, I gave some people $10,000 cash for the first week because they didn't believe that they were going to get it. And here I am giving them cash on Friday. And all of a sudden, you know, the word went out, like, give up your life. <laughs> you go for that job. You know, and we had it, so we gave it. You know, I was young and it was ex caught up in everything. Had to do again, maybe it would be much more refined, but it was the wild, wild east, and we were so excited. And it couldn't have gone better. It was just a dream come true, and the friendships we made, and the how you saw in a year, you go back to a country like Singapore, the men had muscles, the women were in great shape, people had, were conscious about it. It really made a difference. It really mm. did. And, the ancillary product, okay, there's a health food store, there's vitamins, there's this, there's better food, there's better, I mean, it just created a whole world. Mm. And everywhere we went was that way. So it sounds different to the 24-hour fitness business that was here. You know, you sound, it sounded like you had a different approach and there was a, a, this, the psychology of, in terms of your marketing to that person. But how, how did that jump happen from going from the, the traditional clubs in America to picking this? Was, was that something you kind of came from learning about the market or what, what, how did that all come together? That's another good question. Um, you know, when you talk about Mark Mastrop, he was on your show. He's, he's a genius. He, he, he can do the whole thing from top to bottom. And he did that with all of his companies. When I went to Asia, and I was still partners with Mark at the time in 24 Hour, I wanted to do something totally out of the box because we could. When you are already sophisticated like Mark in 24 Hour, there's perimeters, there's, there's laws, there's you know, 40 hours a week, there's, there's, uh, there's already norms out there. We had the chance to create our own, to create a whole new experience. And Ray and I, we were the only two there. He gave me total autonomy to do that. We were 50-50 partners. He believed in, in what I had done because I was his partner already. And in, in America, we wanted to create something that had never been done before. I mean, for instance, when we opened up Hong Kong, our treadmills were Life Fitness 9500. They had the 9100 model, which was also commercial for about $2,000 less, which would have saved us 100000 But I had to tell the team, I said, you may not know the difference between this number and that number, but I'm telling you we have the best equipment. There's not going to be another club that comes behind us with better equipment. You can go to the bank on that. And we did that in everything. So we could tell them that, and they were proud of that. And they, they, they got it. They understood that. And we really had a white slate to do whatever we thought would be the most exciting, the most impactful, the quickest. Um, and it was, so, it, was, it was before Walkmans even, and we blared the music. You walked in and, you know, I got so many complaints, you can't imagine, but I said, when you signed up, was the music on? Was it high octane? Sure it was. So now that you're a member, it's still gonna be that way. I t you know, and that's the branding that I learned at Club Med. I mean, choose your brand. Think about it. Find your ideal avatar customer. One of the biggest mistakes that I make, and many people probably, is we think that our members would like what I want. Mm. That's not real. You can do, you can have gold faucets in your house if you want, but they don't want to pay the extra $10 a month they want to just have regular faucets. So give the customer, you find the ideal customer, give it to them. And we chose that segment that got off on the high energy. It wasn't for everybody. 
And I remember here in Venice Beach, California, Gold's Gym was like <laughs> that, but World Gym was no music. But they never changed. When you create your brand, it's got, you got to stay true to your brand. So our philosophy was, I was so um, intense about it that I would mark the number on the stereo where it had to go, couldn't go down. We create our own CDs, or cassettes at the time. You had to use those only. On the TVs, it had to be fashion TV, MTV, or, lo or sports. That's all you could play. So I remember one day, Singapore wasn't doing so well. This one particular club, Orchard Road, which was the greatest location ever. Well, it, it, the numbers had come down a little bit, and so I paid it a surprise visit. So I come in the club, open the door, right away I know, like I said, I couldn't hear the music. Instead of being blown away by the music, I couldn't hear it. I struggle to hear about it. There's nobody at the reception either. I struggle to hear. I go look, and my number <laughs> is here. And I'm struggling to hear the music, and it's a country and western song about a family who had left this man and his dog bit him. You know, the most depressing sound you could ever... I go to the TV and it's two elderly ladies cutting papaya. So I, I went to the front desk, threw the stereo equipment on Orchard Road, ripped it all out, freaked out, made a you know WWE <laughs> look, feeling about it, called an all-staff meeting, country staff meeting, and freaked out. And, you know, the stereo equipment's on the side. And... They were off brand, and the numbers had come down right away. And it was because we were giving, they, the members had come to expect a certain vibe. It's like if you go to a nightclub and they're not playing the right music. You thought they were playing techno, and they're playing hip hop tonight, or whatever. It's, just, it's the reason why Soul Cycle will do so well. It's a religion already, to where they know exactly what to expect. They're on brand every time. And we were off brand, mm. and we couldn't let that happen. So these were the things that we were going through, and those were the learnings that I had. You, you obviously had a lot of clubs, and you know, I guess some performed better than others. When, when they weren't performing, was there some sort of, you know, was there kind of like a fingerprint of things that, you know, some key things that were, were, were commonly went wrong that you had to fix? Like you mentioned the music, was that one of them? Or, mm -hmm. what, you know, what, what, when it went wrong, what, what went wrong? <laughs> It's all, it's, it's the Michael Jackson uh, story. It's the man in the mirror. It's all about our people. It's all about the manager, the leader, not staying on brand to, to its core. I mean, we had scripts for everything with the right energy. It was, and you know, you, you, you'd see when the numbers go down that all of those personal branding things weren't being done. Because why would it be? I mean, you go and the music is down. Well, it's just not the music down. It's the overall energy that's down. The members came in expecting to get the lift. Again, they didn't have their own music at the time, and we weren't giving it to them. Whether they knew it up front or not, it per all of a sudden they're not bringing in their friends. It's not exciting anymore. The reception wasn't even there. Instead of saying, hey, Eric, how you doing? You know, it was easy because we saw their card, we saw their name. Instead of saying, they're not saying that. And I used to give three-hour seminars to, the, to my company about the WOW experience, how it started as soon, well, before they opened the door. What, what do we have on the windows? As soon as they came near our place, to the second that they left and looked back and saw everything, it had to be the WOW experience. You had to do that. And the clubs that did that had this energy that would create the numbers. Every time the numbers came down, it came down to the lack of energy by the leader, not staying true to our DNA. We had to play the right music, the right volume, the trainers had to look good, they had to feel good, they had to believe in it, our group X had to be wild and crazy, giving it to the members, and once the music turned down, everything turned down. You know, the military, they're, they're perfect, right? They don't make a, a mistake. We were making mistakes. We were off brand. The numbers would come down. Came up to the, it was always the leader. And you can get it back up pretty fast, yeah. but you have to catch it fast. Yeah. Because once it becomes now the new norm, it's number three instead of number eight, is country and western music. 
which I'm a big fan of country, but not at that time in a fitness center. It had to be whatever we chose it had to be. So these were some of the things, but it's always about people. It, it's always about the energy you're gaining from your staff, the love, the passion, the believability, goes to hiring rate, goes to training rate, and it goes to, I mean, my energy, you know, when I was doing it was high octane. You know, I would give it. You have a meeting with me, I'm gonna give it to you. You know, you're gonna get it, you're gonna see it. And that's what we wanted. And we were fortunate enough to have so many great people that today, they're all the biggest leaders in the industry. Mm. They're in charge of the biggest companies in China, Vietnam, all over the world. When you say that, oh, I, I came from California, you moved out, okay, manage it. You know, take it over. Because you came from a power, an energy that they wanted, they didn't know how to get or deliver, and it's sustained, it's still happening. So what do you think changed over there? Because I, I, I guess more, you were the first and more competition came into the market. Do you think that those techniques of being the first mover and nothing to compare it against, you know, was, was more of a thing, a moment in time that worked and, and then would shift as, as competition came in the market? Or, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you think caused the, the, the market to change? Because there's obviously a lot of people that came after you that have really struggled out there, I guess. Cause mm -hmm. it's, a, a little bit, a little about being being first is obviously best, but um, there was other companies that started at the same time as us that didn't get it. Um, it's a lot of everything. We were very successful in, in all of the countries at a period of time. Con uh, countries would have more competition. Many things would morph, but if you stay true to to the core of what made you great, you you may not hit the numbers we had when we were by ourselves in a Hong Kong or a Singapore, but it'll, it'll sustain. Now, now you have 10 clubs, so maybe they're not all at the same level as your first club, but overall it's a great business. I mean, we went from, uh, we, we hit $100 million within three, three years from nothing, it was around three years. We had, we had clubs in Taipei, our first club, uh, we had a million dollars a month in EFT in one club. And everyone was telling me there again, no one's going to work out in Taiwan. It's different than Hong Kong, you know. Okay, people are people. They all want to feel, everyone wants to look and feel great. And having been around the world, I've come down to, to that. That people are people, they're all the same. Hmm. We all want to feel the same way. And each country was different, as I said. And if you have solid business practice, if your personal training gets results, if your group X gets results, if you're receptionist loves their job and gives you the energy as part of the club, you stay on brand, you can sustain it. Yes, you may not be able to stay at the heights of a brand new situation, but the good clubs are always happening, they, they continue. What was your, what did you get to at the peak when out in, in Asia? How many clubs did you get and how we many countries? Had, we were in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, Tha uh, Thailand, Vietnam, went, then we went through Malaysia, China, Australia. So we had covered most of it. Yeah. And uh, it was, every country was fun. It was yeah. great. Yeah. And what, what, what do you, how would you sort of assess the market now from when you were sort of actively involved in it then? Well, I'm doing consulting now. So I go, I go to, I just did a big um, consulting in China, in Beijing last month at China Fit, in a couple of months, going again next month and what I see is a lot of investors are now coming into the market not knowing the game but hiring a CEO that is supposed to know the game that's a big danger a huge danger and a lot of China is like that right now so China is going through and plus China is now realizing about the importance of monthly dues versus term memberships which we all go through that phase. So they're about to go through that now. Um, and that's an important segue. And they don't have social media there. So they have to rely on the real basics of what we had when we started in Hong Kong. The friendships, the respect, the club, part of a club, something bigger than yourself, something that you wanna be part of, that you're proud to be part of. That's what I, when I, when I consult, I say, 
yes, we have to know the latest techniques of A, B, and C, but it comes down to the experience that the member gets. That passion is still the most important thing. You know, the, the consciousness changes. Look at it, uh, the, what's happening in America for all about group workouts, you know, orange theory, all that. It's all, that, that'll maybe end up there, maybe not, because the cultures are slightly different, but the consciousness changes and grows and you want to be at the right place at the right time. You can't be too, for instance, the orange theory, it doesn't work everywhere. It won't work everywhere now, but maybe in three or four years it will. So when I go to the different country and consult, I go back to the basics. I go back to the basics about the giving them much more value than they expected. And then you, you know, you can hone in on the new social techniques, social marketing techniques and everything. But it still comes down to the when I started in the tannies, making the member feel special, getting the results, and have them bring in a friend to their club. And when they walk in, the receptionist, hi Eric, how you doing? Oh, I feel wonderful. I'm she or he knew who I was. I'm part of a club. And my friend who I just brought in now sees that I'm part of the club. And he becomes part of the club or she becomes part of the club. It's about energy, passion, and then the specialized techniques. I don't think our business is ever going to change. It's all about the passion. It's all about the passion. The gym equipment will change. The personal trainers will change their techniques as we learn more about what's working, what doesn't work. I mean, none of us have any shoulders from behind the neck press at Gold's Gym in 1970. <laughs> none of us can lift a shoulder now. That does not done anymore. But we had a lot of fun doing it, you know, and we brought in our friends and we created that cult in, in Gold's Gym. And that, will, that, I mean, that if you could bottle up what Gold's Gym had when they were at their peak starting out, which create, I mean, I own the Gold's Gyms in Toronto, that was also on brand. And that got people people that had never worked out a day in their life, they wanted that. Mm. They wanted that logo. They wanted that. And that's the same thing I would teach to a, today in, in, in Australia. I'll go back, yeah, 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 you got that, you got that. But what's the DNA of your company? What's the brand? Do the members get that? The ones, do they want to be part of it and brag about it? That's social media. Mm. Not taking a picture of you, then... Social media is telling your friend, I love this place. Come with me. That's social media. How do you get the, you said that you know, some of these boutiques may not work in Asia yet because the market's not ready. How, how do you, you know, if, if you've got all those elements right, how, do you, how have you been able to sort of anticipate the right time to go into a new country with, with a new concept? That, that's, that takes a lot of instinct, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of feel and... Uh, time, for instance, you're a big box here and a soul cycle is going to come right next to or a rumble or a grit and you have 50,000 square feet, they have five, you're paying what a 50,000 square foot club is paying versus 5,000, they're paying $30 for a 45 minute class, you're 30 bucks a month and you're getting your butt kicked, what are you going to do about it? It's inevitable it's going to happen. So you have to prepare for that. Members will buy a soul cycle for spinning, for indoor cycling. But if your club is a club, that they're going to add on to their life. They're not going to cut away their club because their club gives them more than the biking, than the swimming pool. You created a loyalty, a stickiness that they have joined your your world. They're part of something bigger than, than that. They don't, don't worry about the fact that there's a spinning company that specializes in spinning right next door. If you're on brand and the members love you, they'll buy that. Why not? So who cares? That's not, that's not an issue. Just make sure they still love your club and give them more than what they expected. They're not going to leave you to join that. They'll join that as well if that's what they do. And not all of them do spinning. And not all, you do boxing. 
focus on making yourselves as good as you can. Mm. You're not going to be as good as a grit in your boxing group. They're going to be a thousand times better than that segment. But they're not going to leave you to go box. They're going to join grit, join rumble, join souls, and stay with their mothership, with their club. And it's not about being afraid of that. It's just about making sure that you're great and you stay on who you are. It's not a problem. What do you think about boutiques? Do you think it's a, a sustainable model and is it something that you'd invest in and would that, you think that you can see that coming to Asia? Yes, I do, I do. I think that uh, it goes to the fact, why do they work? You know, why does it work? Because I want that. I don't need all that. I want indoor cycling. I don't want to go through the free weight room where there's strong people making a lot of noise for me to go to that. Or I specifically want Pilates where the same type of people are like me. It's a safe environment. I go from my car to the door, do the Pilates, go home. I don't have to do the maze of everything else. Mm. I get exactly what I pay for and I know exactly what is going to happen. Don't have someone doing something that's going to interrupt my mind or my pen or what I want. I have 50 minutes, not 55. I have to get to the space where my kind of people do that. And that is the reason, one of the reasons why it's so successful. They know exactly what's going to happen in a safe environment, repeated over and over again. And you cannot do that in a 50,000 square foot club with multiple things. It's not easy to do that. But to replicate a boutique experience, you can. Mm. You can do that. It's just like medicine. I mean, there used to be MDs. Okay, I'll do everything. Today, you're not gonna go to an MD for a tear in your shoulder. You're not even gonna go to a, 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 an overall orthopedic. You're gonna find shoulder specialist who specializes in tear on that shoulder. That's what we are. It's, it's evolved to that now. Fitness will be like that too. That doesn't mean that the big boxers aren't going to survive. It comes down to the individual company and how great they are. And your members not leaving. Now there are ways to mitigate a boutique coming into your big box, you know. And they are about, if you wanted to go ahead and spruce up your, let's say it's a boxing area, you can make yours better. But you're not going to be able to give them what? a grit will do or a rumble, but certainly keep them if that's something that they're interested in. And, or even make a new door and add that to your big box. And you can charge members again if that's what you want. So it all depends on the philosophy of where you're going, but I've never been afraid of competition. It's just the, the consciousness and the new ads to the industry, the new people coming and getting started versus splitting the the hairs with other clubs, it's 10 to 1. You know, it's not like, okay, a new gym is opening up a mile from me, which they do. But in that mile, there's 10,000 new people that have decided to make a commitment towards health and fitness this year. Mm. Focus on making yourself great. If you're a boutique, make sure that you're, you're that much better than everyone else because you're competing against swimming pools and this and that, even though people don't use them, you're, you're up against that. You know, I, I just came back from China and they were talking about that topic. You take an average person in Beijing and you say, okay, would you spend the same amount of money on one class for 45 minutes at a specialized boutique or have access to my 100 clubs in Shanghai with swimming pools, basketball courts? They say, of course not. It's ridiculous. It hasn't come close to their consciousness yet. It's way too advanced. We were talking about mm. before. You can't be that. So to put that in there at this, at this stage hasn't worked yet in China. It's not working yet. Do you think a lot of people make those mistakes and go in these countries too early and invest a lot yeah, of money? Sure. It's a consciousness thing. You have to know. You have to feel it. And you really have to have local knowledge. Because, and I've made the, the mistake many times where I wasn't there. I relied on people. And going back to my first story about Hong Kong, I sold 1,200 memberships 
for that very reason, to get the first hand cut, not a filter cut. So when you go to a new country or have a new idea, you have to be part of the local scene. You have to learn as much as you can about that. That'll help you in your decision. Are you too early? Mm. Are you too late? Is that something that they'll never want? You know, I mean, the Asian body, let's say, for instance, when, I, when we first got there, there was no such thing as a woman having muscles. None. That would, they would be, you know, I heard all the time, I don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger from a, a 90 pound lady. I said, well, it's not gonna, you're not going to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But they were abhorrent to that. They didn't want to even think about it. As things get, there's muscles out there. Not big bulky muscles, but they're all in shape. Things change. Things change. Mm. Consciousness rises. Uh, you have to, if you push the wrong thing. I mean, we opened up with Cindy Crawford, who wasn't a muscled lady. She was a professional supermodel who represented, we thought, the American look of what Asians would want. And then we hired the top Asian models to match it. We never would have shown a muscle. And my competitor, I remember, we opened up at the same time a New York Fitness opened up in Hong Kong. Our first, we had a full page color ad with Cindy Crawford, and they had a muscle man doing squats in their picture. And I looked at that and I, you know, I said, okay, that's, that's nice. I'm glad I saw that. I mean, I've never been trying to put down the competition, but they were so off topic. They made it so much easier. Learning about the local culture, vital, vital. As an <coughs> entrepreneur going through this, and you obviously went through quite an interesting journey, what were some of the things that you had to work on for your own development? You know, you talked about the, the visualization part, and obviously that sounds like something that you practiced, and, and that was part of your, your routine. What other things were, did you learn and, and improve as you, as you went through that process? Well, you know, the, the experience every day, you had another experience where you had, you know, tested you. You were being tested at all times from internal, external, things that you had never heard of before. So you had to learn, you had to be very resilient. Being in multiple countries, having, I mean, we, you, you'd be on, we'd be on a telephone call with seven or eight countries with, they're talking in Wan, they're talking in Yen, they're talking Hong Kong dollars with an accent. I mean, you'd be blown away at the end of the call. It was like, what was that? <laughs> what happened, you know? So you had to evolve with that. But um, you had to be very disciplined in your own life. At that time, I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning. I would do 90 minutes of meditation, followed by pranayama, followed by yoga. My yogi would come to my, my house. i do my workout. So from 4.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock, and then i do all my calls by the swimming pool, get the energy from the swimming pool, I'd make all my calls. So I was so at such a peak, mentally, physically, spiritually, I had to be that. I had to represent that because I was tested every day, all the time, by my own staff, by the members, by the media, I had to represent that. I had to have biceps. I had to have a six pack. I had to have the energy. I had to believe in it. I had to say, well, yeah, I just did 90 minutes of yoga. Yeah, I had, yeah, I, I, yeah, I did that. Yes, it's me. And I don't think that'll ever change. And we're talking about other people, Bedros Kuvian talking about the importance of his morning routine, Dean Grossi, all these people, they, Take the time to make sure that the golden goose is shining. Without that, it's not going to happen. And you're going to be tested all the time. And I was young and... You it know, must be tempted when you're out there, like, young, with, you know, with the financial sort of returns that you must have been getting and having the best club. I guess it must have been tempted to burn the candle at both ends. It was, yeah, we did. <laughs> but, but, but not at the sacrifice of the, your, your, your routine. As I said, my father instilled that in me when I was so young, and I never drank. I never did that. That's not was I didn't like the I didn't like the feeling that tomorrow, the next day, I couldn't meditate or I or I had a hangover. I mean, I've been drunk twice in my life. It wasn't worth it for me. It never was. Even at Club Med, I never drank. It 
fitness and health was most important. It wasn't that I'm a that I'm you know a Puritan and I have to. It was my real belief. It was who I am, and still I would like to. I look at a tape someone just sent me of a motivational tape that I had made in you know 15 years ago. And I'm looking at myself and I say, Oh yeah, <laughs> all right. I better get back there because I'm not there. But at that time, I was I was right on. I was I was there, and the closer. I mean, your your team wants that. They want the leader to to walk the walk, talk to, to be be real. And I was when I got there, and I gave it a hundred percent. And I was like I said when managing Asia talked to me about being a hard sell. What are you talking about hard sell? I'm I'm giving health and happiness. Why would it be a hard sell? We're passionate. You may take passion for a hard sell. That's because you don't understand. You haven't had that pump that makes you say, I can do this, I'm, I can be healthy, I can be a better father, I can be a better uh, mother, son, whatever, I can be a better student, just by getting that pituitary gland to give me that shot. I feel good now, I can do it. Why would I have to hard sell that? That's a magic, that's magic. So, you know, it's the biggest show in Asia, they're, they're testing me on that. I had to look the part, I had to believe it. And she says, well, tell me about your life. What did you do this morning? So at 4.30, I'm doing that. At 5.30, I'm doing six. I'm doing it at 7.30, I'm doing it to get to the show by eight o'clock. I had already done four hours of that. She said, did you? I said, yes, okay. <laughs> right, and you can't fake that. You can't fake that. And that's what it was all about. How did, you, how, how did you deal, like, I'm, I'm sure you had to do failure, but what was, what was some of your big failures and how did you sort of overcome those? Yeah, I'll tell you when, when, talk, when we talk about pressure. So in Hong Kong, there's a, Hong Kong is, is not corrupt. It's a very strictly regulated uh, country. And there's a group called the ICAC, which is basically anti-corruption board. And I get this phone call from so-and-so, inspector so-and-so from the ICAC. I said, okay, you know, what's, how can I help you? Well, I'd like to come down and talk to you. I didn't think we were doing anything wrong, you know, and we're doing the best we can to stay on everything. And he says, um, nice guy, young guy. He shows me a promotion and he says, can you tell me about that promotion? Now, I knew right away. I knew right away where he was going with that. It was a simple, bring in a friend and your friend will get a discount. And I knew already, because I was pretty sharp, that what he was going to tell me was that, oh, some of my staff are giving them out to people that are not buddy referrals, which I don't really care. Yeah, you're supposed to care, but we got all the members. And I knew he knew that. And I said, well, it's not exactly like it is. It's kind of, we just want the new members. He said, and he just looked at me and says, don't BS me. Let's be clear now. I want to have this place inundated with 500 of my team in five minutes, I can do that. So let's go back, explain the promo to me. So he knew I knew he knew, <laughs> and he knew I knew he knew. So we had to talk real. I said, well, you know, well it's supposed to be a member sponsored. He said, well, that's not what's happening at this club. I said, oh, what are they doing? And, you know, so they're giving an unfair advantage to some people over another, and you can't have that. Your staff is not following your rules. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll go and tell them that, and I'll go clean that up right away. He says, that's not good enough. They've already broken the law. I said, well, it's kind of an internal, this is not. They gave an unfair advantage to someone over another. I'm thinking that, on the, that, that phrase still haunts me today. <laughs> To make a long story short, he, he, he says to me, we're going to have to go after your staff and have to arrest the staff. I said, come on, these are, these are students, they're 18, 19, 20 years old. We're going to have to you know, arrest them for doing that promo. And that, it seemed real at the time that they were going to do that. And I remember the, the, the feeling that I had, and we worked it out, but it was close. It was close that that type of thing could happen in a strange country because that was important to them. It doesn't make sense maybe here, but at that time, and, and we, I, I said to him, if you do that, take the keys because we're going to be done. Because he even said, we're even thinking about having the members called up. 
And I'm thinking, how do I tell Ray? Okay, Ray, the good news and bad news. The good news is we sold a lot of membership. The bad news is we're all going to be arrested for selling them. So those are some of the challenges that you yeah. have that you, they seem innocent to you. We all, you know, do, we don't keep the promos as, as sanitary as we'd like, but in the wrong country, it means a big thing. Yeah. Lisa, how would I have known that? Even though I probably knew that they were doing that, it was just a membership getting. Yeah, it sounds like when you're out there, you you know you, you you tread a very fine line. You know when you're going into some of these new markets, as a as an international person, you know it, you, I guess you've got to be very careful with yeah. you know what what happens. You do because you're a guest. You're never you're never a local. You're always a guest, yeah. and you have to respect that. It's it's it's. It's their country, it's their culture. You just are trying to add, make it make a benefit and realize that they have the power and you're a guest, that's it. So what's your predictions on what's next? Like I, I've heard you've got your fingers in a few pies, but where, you know, where do you, what's, what's next for you and what do you think is next for the, for the industry? The industry, you know, is going to continue. We're in the... It's just, it's going to broaden to, so it went from muscles to fitness to group X to yoga, yoga being the end all be all. The next step is meditation. Meditation, so there's a few here already popping up uh, because meditation is actually the culmination of everything. It, it's, it's the movement as we were talking before about quantum physics and the self-help, it all ends up at meditation, whatever style you're talking about. Yoga ends up at meditation. Yoga, is, as we know, it's huge. I'll tell you a story about yoga in a second, how it restarted, but meditation and expanding your life without sacrificing your body, because it's all part of it, but it's going the whole world as yoga, you know, I'll tell you, yoga was dead 20 years ago. We were in, in, Cal, in Asia, we had one class a week, and, you know, we had two or three people show up. In 24 hour here, same thing. And I'm a lover of yoga. I, I've been studying it all my life, and I thought about that. And we went, I went to India to f find these real yogis that were not simple teachers, but they lived it. They were third, fourth generation yogis. And I remember I brought this one who was already in Singapore who approached me, a yogi, and he smelled bad, he looked bad, he was a he wasn't even illegal. He was a construction worker. But he had I knew right away he had that power of attraction that you get through yoga. There's a certain power you get early on. And within a week, he had 100 people in his class and 100 people waiting to get in. From that, we opened up in Hong Kong. Within about six months, we had 30,000 students a month going through it. And we propagated all of Asia and brought it to here because now we were part of 24 Hour. Mark understood everything as he always does, and it's, it took off. And it's everywhere now. So that can happen when the essence is right. The world was, was ready for it. It just wasn't available. And we were part of that, which I, I love. I mean, maybe it'll counterbalance all my other karma. Because <laughs> that, that's good karma. The next thing is meditation. Meditation by itself, as part of the fitness centers, as standalones, as part of, you got your nutrition package, here's your meditation package. That's the future. And that is going to be as big as yoga. Mm. And that's happening now. And it's going to happen, and everything to do with meditation, the cushions, the, the environment, the, the whole world of yoga, again, in the meditation, and the self-help around that, all that stuff like we were talking about before, that's what's going to happen. Of course, the techniques of physical fitness will continue. The ideals of what the body's supposed to look like will change. Medicine is changing every day. People are going towards quantum health, realistic, you know, anti-drug, what's the right way to feel good. 
Is, is your mind able to, is your brain able to heal you? All that stuff goes to the meditation. And that's going to create another tsunami, which will never stop. And that's, that's the next big thing. As far as my, myself, um, I'm consulting, you know, uh, ericlivingglobal.com. I'm consulting because there's so many wonderful gym owners that really don't have it. They don't have the information. They're, they're looking for magic pills, and it's really the same as we did, you know, at Vic Tannies in, in the 70s. It's about the passion and how to create that. So I'm doing that. I'm speaking in, in different um, conventions around the world, doing consulting. I'm part of a, a couple of different companies that uh, were um, Manny Pacquiao, the boxer. We're doing HIT uh, through Philippines, like Rumble. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm trying to work with Grit, uh, my friends that own Grit. So there's a few different things that we're doing and doing master classes around the world because uh, that's fun for me to teach and train and we go into companies that want that and uh, giving back it's it's still the same feeling you know making people healthy and happy and that's how i see what's mm. happening now and how do you how do you choose the areas like the manny pacquiao one sounds quite interesting <laughs> yeah how do you you choose the things that you get involved in now and what what, what motivates you to still keep doing that well, on the, uh, on the meditation side, which we're looking at, my wife and I, how we can scope that out, how we can scale it out, because it's definitely happening. Um, when I see a, a, a unique situation like a Manny Pacquiao doing a similar to Rumble, except the classes are not choreographed by a dancer, but they're choreographed by an eight-time world champion, it gives that authenticity, makes it exciting for me. So if it's unique enough, I'll do it. Mm. It'll, it'll, if it turns me on, I'll do that. On the other hand, something new and exciting that's never been done before also gets me excited, mm. like this meditation that we're talking about. So I'm always looking for unique, real, and tomorrow. It's coming. How can you create that now? Because it's here already. Everything's already been thought of. Just manifest it. Be manifested first, get detailed about it, believe in it 100%. And that, that's one of my reasons why I've been successful. Because people would say I'm a great salesperson. No, I'm not. I can't sell something I don't believe in. I can't sell one of them. If I, can, if I believe in it, I'm not selling anyway, but I'm going to get the results. And I think that's the way it is. In every, in every, should be that way everywhere. What does success mean to you then? Um, success means happiness, if, if feeling good about yourself, about what you've created, about the people that you've affected. You know, I, I have received so many beautiful letters from people that, you know, my, my husband's alive because of, of your company. I'm alive because of your company. I met my husband here and our children are this, they're working for you. The, 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 the letters, I mean, through the fitness and through the yoga and everything that we've done, we've changed so many people's lives for the better. That's success. Mm. That's success. We benefited from it uh, physically, financially, spiritually, karmatically, every way possible, and want to continue that. Every success is different for everybody, but for, for me, it's about how many people we've affected in a positive way, and keep doing that. Keep doing that. Mm. So final question then, Eric. Um, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you believe is impossible or other people have told you is impossible. Um, outside of opening a health club in Hong Kong, what, what would be a memorable example of escaping your own uh, personal limits? I would say jumping into Asia, you know, when everyone, every smart person would have said, don't do it. You can't afford $250,000 a month. And, you know, we're signing a five-year lease, personal signing. Now, I don't know about me, but Ray Wilson, he would have been on the hook for mm -hmm. what? You know, $30 million. <laughs> That's a pretty big, pretty big leap. But actually leaving the Vic Tannies, you know, five, $6,000 a month to go work for $60 a month was another one of those mm -hmm. <laughs> escape my limits, leave that, 
to go to that where I had never even heard of Martinique. I didn't know anything, but I, I was ready. I was ready to escape my limits, go for it 100%, pedal to the metal, do it. And it's kind of goes back to when I, I asked my mother, so what's the difference between my brother and I? She said, you guys would be jumping on the bed. And your brother would say, well, what happens if I jump to the other bed and I don't make it? She said, by that time, Eric, you had already jumped. So I've been jumping all my life. And uh, I really don't believe in, in limits that are given to me by society. I do believe more now, at my, you know, as I'm getting older and maybe a little wiser, that limits are your, you know, your, own, your, own make, your own making. It has to be that way, or you're going to be unhappy. I mean, sometimes I've gone too far. I've jumped too high and got you know, bruised by it. But going back, the regrets versus the, the wins, I wouldn't change any of it. It's adrenaline. I've had such a wonderful life, affected so many people and vice versa. The great people that I've worked with and learned from, I wouldn't change, change a day of it. It's been more than exciting. And in my time that I've done, I've lived 10 lifetimes. And I'm really happy with how, how it's going and how it went. And nothing's perfect, but I escaped my limits, I think, when I was very young. <laughs> fantastic. Well, Eric, it's a, it's a wonderful story. There's some, some fantastic lessons there. And I'm sure you've got many more stories, maybe enough for a part two at some point. So, sure, I'd uh, love to. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.